In the last, really the last eight years, um, we, you know, we've probably seen a 300% increase in the number of brands and beers that are available now uh, that you couldn't find here before. I worked in a lot of the can factories for the last seven years and I slowly saw the cans they were producing being changed from all Coors Light, all Miller Light, all Budweiser to microbrews, you know, from California, Colorado, East Coast, and just kind of seeing that trend, you know, really got sparked my, uh, sparked my curiosity into the industry. Well, it seems that uh, the number of breweries has just exploded all across the U.S. in the last few years. I remember back when uh, Mark and Aaron and I were just originally starting to you know, form an idea for the brewery and when we first decided we wanted to do this, there was maybe, uh, there was between 1,500 and 2,000 breweries across the U.S. Um, and, so, and that was in uh, 2010 or 2011, something like that. Now there is over 3,000 breweries, so it's just really exploded all across the U.S. Even eight years ago, I, I started a blog about craft beer, and back then there were literally the number of brands I could count on one hand that you could get here locally uh, with any regularity at all. And now there are uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Yeah, it's actually becomes a little bit of a problem because there's limited shelf space, more beers than, than places to put it. Um, so it's, I mean, it's changed. Uh, it's just been exponential growth in the last eight to 10 years. In Southern Illinois alone, there's been uh, multiple breweries to open up since 2010. Um, so after Big Muddy, which I think he opened up in 2009-ish, um, you know, since, since Big Muddy Brewing, uh, there's uh, Von Jakob, Little Egypt Brewing, um, there's a newly opened Abbey Ridge Brewing south of Murfreesboro, and then in not so southern Illinois, there's, uh, there's Kaskaskia Brewing in Redbud, there's Excel Brewing in Breeze, Illinois. Um, there's been breweries to open up, you know, farther north of, of there too. Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, during the sort of the height of the uh, recession, you know, recently we talked about uh, the alcohol industry being recession proof to some extent. And I think uh, to some extent it is. I mean, regardless of what the, uh, the financial situation and the economic situation is locally, um, I think people will always, um, you know, look for those things that, that really are part of the staples in their life. And, and you know, on the one hand, you have the people who, who will drink the lowest common denominator beer and that, but there are others that are looking for something special. I think people just started to realize that there is a lot more beer out there other than just um, the really um, large uh, mega breweries, you know, the stuff that they produce. Get the chocolate milk stuff. We can get you some. And um, a lot of it's really interesting, and a lot of it's really tasty. And um, you know, it's not all like chewing through your beer like some people originally thought. It just it actually has flavor and a little bit of body. Yes, I think uh, even when the economy was lower, that was something that people were still interested in and still buying. Um, and then as, as things are starting to improve, uh, you see that more and more. People are looking for local, they're looking for quality, uh, they're looking for things that are unique, um, not necessarily the things that uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago were, were the most popular. This one has quite a few different grains in it. Typically, we try to keep the uh, number of different malts to a minimum, um, but this one just happens to have quite a few in it. Today, we are making a uh, milk stout. Um, also known as a sweet stout or cream stout. So it's uh, mostly barley and um, so you have mostly Marisotter, which is a base malt. It's a very pale colored um, English, English malt. So it's got a really nice uh, biscuity, um, grainy flavor to it. I've been amazed uh, since we've uh since we've been in the uh, the local craft beer business, just how much support there is throughout the uh, 
throughout the area really for what these breweries are doing. That's kind of kind of what our our mission is is just to make beer that you know kind of has the flavor of Southern Illinois. And so as you see small startups uh, happening, social media plays a big part of that. So. Uh, you know, people are by word of mouth, or at least virtual word of mouth, um, getting the word out about these places, and, and folks are showing up and and, and really creating destinations because um, I think that's what's really important, especially in a more rural area, is to create a destination where people can take a, a Friday or a Saturday and spend a few hours at a brewery. Every week that we brew, we brew two or three times a week, and we always brew something different, um, and that just depends on the weather, you know, as far as what temperature it is outside, what yeast we have available at the time, and then what ingredients we have available to us. A lot of the beers that um, we have on on tap on a given weekend, you know, we may never have again. So um, I think that that keeps people coming out. The fact that we have nine different beers on and it'll always be something different. The second one down the line is the smoked apple ale which we made with, um, I think about uh, a bushel, about one bushel of Honeycrisp apples from Miller's Orchards in Murfreesboro. Uh, the third one down the line is a Spice Bush Belgian, which we um, use Spice Bush berries um, and the wood and the leaves. So uh, it's got a little bit of a peppery, um, somewhat like allspice um, character to it and then the leaves in the wood are very citrusy and aromatic so you get a little bit of citrus from the leaves and the wood uh, and then the Belgian yeast strain also provides a little bit of fruitiness and some uh, peppery characteristics and the idea for the brewery you know the kind of beers that we brew with all of our foraged ingredients that came kind of from I guess um, uh, Aaron's interest in foraging for roots and herbs and things that he did since he's since he was in junior high. Aaron does most of the foraging. Um, he knows pretty much what you can get, where, what time of the year. So he does a lot of it. So yeah, we really don't have to go too far when we're uh, gathering stuff. We use this plant here a, a lot. This is a type of, um, it's called uh, Virginia thyme. Yeah, it's a native wild plant. So like these here, when they're green, they have, uh, they have a really rich nutty flavor. So for these, we would, we would throw these shells into the, uh, into the boil when we're brewing beer, and it would give us uh, a spiciness and a cinnamon and a slight vanilla taste. But for a batch of beer, you'd probably have to gather about two gallons of these. You know, if you're making a quality product, people have shown that they're willing to travel for it. Uh, and that's very true of the craft beer world. Um, you have folks that will do uh, trips planned across the United States just going to, to craft breweries, one to another to another. So word of mouth is huge. It's important to grow that audience. I mean, the, the wineries have been a good model for what I think small uh, craft breweries are looking to do in Southern Illinois. I mean, you know, the wineries have grown look in the last 20 years, uh, just how many of them there are now and how well established they are on the wine trail. Well, I think a similar thing is going to happen with beer locally uh, as you have more and more small craft brewers uh, opening. People are going to be able to have opportunities to visit multiple breweries in a day, um, you know, get groups together and take a bus or a van and, and go and visit breweries uh, just like you would the wine trail. Um, so it offers that unique experience. Plus the wineries have embraced what the local breweries are doing and most of the wineries will also offer local product. You're seeing some crossover as well. Um, so you see those that are making beer and wine. Um, and, uh, and branching out that way, probably eventually getting into the distilling side of things as well. So um, it really just becomes an artisan product from start to finish, whether it's wine or beer or spirits. Locally, we grow lots of apples. A couple, a couple of thousand acres of apples are grown in the region, and this is an old apple growing region. It had always occurred to me, it's a shame someone's not doing more with apples. About five years ago, started really thinking hard about hard cider. And um, the industry was, there was a lot of buzz 
where there were a few small producers that were just starting to get going. That's what I wanted to be a part of and help everybody grow, and that's kind of what this, this is for, is to help the little guy you know, do what he wants to do, because most times they wouldn't even think twice about canning. Because they don't have the capital, they don't have you know, the means. So that's why we call it I Can Solutions, because we try to be the solution for the problem, which is they can't can. The craft beer in a can phenomenon has been something that's, uh, of course, uh, uh, taken hold already in um, states like Colorado for some time. The cans are lighter, you'll have longer shelf life. Um, you know, they don't have to purchase any equipment, so it works out really well for them. And the sweet thing about it is they're, you know, they're working with the people that do the labels. Um, you know, they're handling, applying the labels to the cans. So they literally roll up with a complete package and we just chug and plug and go. You know, interestingly enough, since we're standing in front of a canning line, a year ago I would have never thought I would have canned cider either. So it's one of these things where the, the, the market and the industry is changing rapidly and you've got to be really open-minded and not stuck on convection, convention so much. But you're starting to see more and more breweries uh, now go to that package. And it's really in some ways, uh, there's still a perception that a can is, is maybe an inferior product in some way, shape, or form, or cheapens a brand a bit. And that may have been true 25 years ago, uh, but the technology has gotten so much better with canning and uh, you know they use uh, uh, organic polymer resins on the inside of the can. So the myth about uh, a beer in a can tasting like metal, it just isn't the case anymore. I think that, you know, the power of the whole thing is it is new, it needs to be approachable, it needs to be fun, and then, you know, if you're discovering great ciders inside, that's great. Uh, plus, a can is really superior in some ways. It's like a small keg, so it's impervious to light. Uh, it's more portable. It's easier to recycle. Uh, and uh, you can take a can places that you can't always take a bottle. Um, a lot of outdoor events don't allow glass, um, things like that. So uh, it, re it really is very versatile and it's easy. And um, you know we're fortunate to have a few brands in our portfolio that have been canning for a good while. Uh, Tallgrass Brewing Company, for example, uh, out of Manhattan, Kansas, um, has been canning their beers. And that's all they do are can their beers. So if you don't get the beer on draft, it's going to be in 16-ounce cans. So I think you're going to see more and more of that. Uh, we travel all around St. Louis, Illinois, uh, Indiana, Ohio. Just like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Sprite, exact same way, just a little bit smaller scale. So they're getting the quality of a high-speed line. Uh, they're getting the shelf life, they're getting everything you could want, but in a small package and be able to do small quantities. Uh, mobile canning has, has become uh, a big player here locally. Um, uh, both Big Muddy Brewing Company and uh, Apple Knocker Hard Ciders have both utilized mobile canning. Uh, for their products, and uh, it's been a good experience. I mean, the feedback we get from from both the brewery and the cidery are they're very happy with the product. It looks really good. And then we just pick up the cans as needed, so you don't have to store them on site. And we bring them here the day that we need the can, exactly what we need: cardboard flats, PackTech can carriers, and uh, do that day's work, and then hit the road and head home. It's, it's making canning possible for us. I mean, period. Otherwise, we would be locked in, in the bottles. On the distribution side of things, it's interesting to watch how, how it expands. Um, you know, I think as, uh, as the idea of craft beer becomes something that more and more people are conversant with and they understand sort of what that is, um, the more they're embracing it. Oh, the Muddy Monster Brew Fest has been huge. This last year was the fifth year for that festival, and it's it's grown every year. Uh, there were more breweries there this year than there's ever been before. Oh, every year it, it just it just grows. Probably, I would guess there would be an additional at least 500 people here today than there were last year. 
and every year it grows a little more and we've been doing this for five years so <laughs> we didn't know what to expect we didn't know how it worked but it set up great and was came in and just started drinking <laughs> they don't taste like any other beers usually <laughs> it's really hard to find like they have some really special stuff more and more people are interested in the craft beer industry and it's a it's a great place to enjoy lots of different beers and experience all the different flavors there are out there with that. You know, craft beer has certainly uh, uh, made its way throughout our entire distribution footprint now. Uh, it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of our business. Um, we'll never compete in volume with, with our flagship brands uh, like the Budweiser and Bud Light brands, of course, and that's not really the intention, but craft beer you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's smaller quantities, but we're usually dealing at a little, little bit higher price points and better margins for the retailers. So it really adds up. Now, sort of fast forwarding a few years, having been in this, um, we see, uh, you know, our customers, uh, retailers, restaurants everywhere, um, asking for more and more craft beer uh, options because they're being asked of their client base and customers for these things. I think a lot of people are, are being turned on to the various types of beer. And then the fact that people are realizing there is a market out there for it. And uh, so other people are wanting to open a brewery because there's still a very large portion of that market left for craft breweries to have. I really do think the sky's the limit. And uh, you know, again, tying in with the wine trail, eventually you might see a, a beer trail or a beer path uh, for Southern Illinois with you know, a dozen or two dozen uh, breweries on that that you can travel to in a day's time or two.